You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Leisha Cornwall on the show with me. She has an amazing new book. It's called The Woman at the Front. And when you're hearing this, uh, it will have come out yesterday for uh, for a lot of people in the listening audience, and you can go grab it. It's what a fantastic book. I love this book. I know others are going to love it as well. Welcome to the show, Leisha. Well, thank you, Hank. Thank for thank you for having me. It's uh, it's wonderful to be here, and thank you for your kind words about the woman at the front. Oh well, thank you, and uh, and and they're they're all true and heartfelt. Um, I, I do think people are going to love this book. Um, but before we get into talking about all that great stuff, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, um, I was always a reader when I was a kid. I was the I was the kid who used to read in bed with the lights out, and my mother would tell me, "You're going to ruin your eyes." And and yeah, she was right. I wear glasses for everything now, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I I love the books of Roald Dahl, uh, things like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the Fantastic Mr. Fox, and I especially loved Anne of Green Gables. And um, Anne's character is this that dreamy kid who goes around naming trees and and making up stories and I I thought wow I'm just like that and when she became a writer it sort of said to me okay yes this is a possible thing that you can do with all that dreaminess so yes that's <laughs> and I've oh, always read so I love that where in in your uh, your bookish life um that you've had do you remember um a and maybe it was Roald Dahl for you, um, but do you remember if there was an author or a a particular book or a series that kind of let you know that books could transport you to somewhere else? That 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 the art of storytelling, you know, is uh, is is kind of ethereal in a way. You know, you that that th- did someone give you the feeling um, that when you finished a book, you know, I've been transported somewhere else. Yes. Um, I guess my favorite series when I was a kid was The Happy Hollisters, which is an old, old book series. You can still find them in used bookstores now and then about a family of kids who uh, who went around solving mysteries and they, they would go somewhere on holiday. And of course, a mystery would pop up. And I just I just thought, oh, that would be fantastic to, to live that way. And that was the, the biggest sort of way of being transported for me is like uh, sort of going out in the woods and pretending I was uh, I was Pam Hollister and, and solving my mysteries. And so, yeah, that was. Uh... I love that. <laughs> um, Leisha, um, you are from Canada, is that right? I am. Yes. And I'm... and you oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No problem. I'm originally from uh, Toronto and Ottawa, and I now live out in the in the West uh, near Calgary. In Alberta. One thing that I, I love to ask people and um, is um, how a sense of place affects the the stories that we tell or um, you know, has a way of seeping in in, in sometimes the most uh, seemingly random ways or ways that people don't expect um, it. You the the place that you grew up or the place that you live now. Do you feel like affects the type of storyteller that you are? Absolutely. Um, when I when I moved here to Alberta, I was absolutely uh, stunned by how beautiful the foothills are, and I I almost love them more than the actual mountains. Um, and it's ranching country, and the Prince of Wales, uh, the, who became Edward VIII, actually owned a ranch here. He was so enamored with it. And I find that uh, when I write stories, uh, particularly the woman at the front, one of the, the characters is a surgeon. And his brother had immigrated to Canada, and he starts telling the heroine, when, I, when the war is over, I'm going to move there. 
and this is what my brother had said about it. And it was absolutely magical sort of writing about that part of the world that, that meant so much to me. And uh, a, a lot of people actually did that after the war. They, they moved to, uh, to a new place and started a whole new life. So yes, um, Alberta has, uh, and the history has always sort of been in my mind when I've been writing. So uh, yeah. <laughs> You have said, Leisha, that you feel like you were born in the wrong century. Um, that, and, and I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, when my wife and I are are talking about books, or when we're watching a movie together, we love historical fiction. We love um, stories that transport us to a place that um, you know can seem kind of glossy and romantic on the surface, and. Um, you know, is 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 fraught with other problems <laughs> as you yes. as you dig in. Um, but what what is it about historical fiction? Be- because you have written quite a lot of historical stories, and um, with your new book, it you've uh, you've taken a bit of a turn, but still, I, I I think it's very much in line with a lot of the other things that you've written. Um, what is it about historical fiction and history in general, and maybe thinking about a uh, a time and place that's uh, removed from where we are now. What is it about that that fascinates you? I've always I've always been sort of enthused by history. I mean, my mother's one of the people who would we would drive down a road and she would see a blue historical plaque and car veers over and we stand in front of it and read it and uh, <laughs> just just the stories of of things that had gone before and imagining what had happened. Uh, in in those places and to those people and and uh, sort of the the fact that it's another world that uh, is more interesting than the the one you're in. I mean, who wants to look at a grade five math textbook when you can read about uh, right. know, fairy tales and and the past? And I I found that when I read even even when I read fiction stories, it made me want to know about uh, the real history behind it. And I spent a lot of time reading real history. I was such a nerd uh, when I was about 10, I think the the Masterpiece Theatre series on uh, the Six Wives of Henry VIII came out and I was absolutely blown away and I'd go to school and I'd tell my friends, you've got to watch this. And of course they thought I was crazy, um, but that led to an interest in reading about that era in history and, and it takes you on and on and on as you read about the personalities and the um, the things that really happened. It's uh, it's just an endless, wonderful wormhole to go down, and it's so fulfilling to find out, and so breathtaking. Absolutely. So, from from an early age, you knew that you were going to be a storyteller. This was a, a passion that just burned brightly in you. Um, I love to hear how people. Um, and we've done, um, you know. Uh, over 1500 episodes of this show and um, talked with lots and lots and lots of writers. And it, one thing that I find very interesting is that um, of those many, many writers that we've talked to, um, very few of them have the story of, I, I always knew I wanted to be a writer and it, it was a singular purpose that, mm-hmm. you know, everything that they pursued in life, um, you know, went toward that goal. Most people know from an early age, you know, I'm I'm going to be a storyteller. I'm going to I'm going to write books. And then the journey to that is uh, is fascinating. You know, people go all over the place. Um, what about you? What did was this, you know, you know, were you writing books at 18 when you finished school? Um, you know, did life get in the way? What, what was it like for you? It, it kind of did. I, I uh, wrote stories when I was throughout school and um, I, I actually won a, an award for, from a university for an essay that I wrote. Um, and uh, but when it came time to go to university, I mean, you sort of give in to family pressure. It's like, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. I mean, they didn't have creative writing programs then. It was like the, the, the very beginning of the 80s. And uh, so my mother said, well, you, you've got to go into psychology, which I hated. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up going and taking a class in uh, advertising writing. And um, of course, in those days, it's like you're, you're a young woman trying to break into advertising. It's like, well, you go be a typist for five years first. 
Um, so I, f I managed to find a few junior copywriting jobs, including one writing uh, direct marketing packages for uh, insurance, <laughs> which was, uh, I, I kept telling myself, okay, this is all training for the day when I will write a novel. And um, I had my own freelance writing business when I lived in Ottawa. And when we moved out here to Calgary, uh, my husband joined his mother's, uh, mother's firm. They're uh, technical writers and editors. And I thought, well, I, I really don't want to do that. And because I've lost my contacts for my own business, I'm going to try writing novels. And I decided I would, uh, I would tell romance not the stories at first. And I had, uh, I, I had so many that I wanted to try. And it took about three or four years before I was brave enough to send them out and uh, actually accept that there are good rejections and bad rejections. Sure. Uh, you just have to keep on trying. And finally, I finaled in a contest, uh, a writing contest that was associated with a writing conference I was going to. And uh, one of the one of the perks of doing that was getting to choose the agent of of your choice to have a private meeting with. Nice. And uh, I pitched to the the lady who eventually became my agent. Now she did not want my my contest entry, which came in second, uh, but. I, when I, she asked me to send her something else, I did, and that became my first book about a year and a half later. So that was, uh, and I'm still with that agent. She's absolutely brilliant. She's oh, that's just fantastic. When, uh, when my romance career, I'd written about 15 books, and I was in the middle of a contract, um, and I got an email one morning saying, we're canceling the contract. The sales are not good enough, and we're going in a new direction with other authors. And I was absolutely stunned of course and my agent said well you've been planning on writing something different it's time to get out of romance and actually do that thing uh, so write the historical world war one story you've been considering and let's see where that goes and the woman at the front at, at the front comes out tomorrow <laughs> so I, that's I where it went that. yeah you said something very interesting, Alicia. Um, you said that in in those couple of years um, where you were you're trying to be a novelist, um, mm -hmm. you said you got up the nerve to send them out. How many books did you write during that time? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> probably oh, so many, so many. I mean, you you sit there and you type and you type and you have really no idea um, how to craft a novel, but right. the ideas flow and the words go onto the page and they're all awful. So I would say probably when I cleaned out the basement last, there were probably at least 10 <laughs> bad <laughs> manuscripts. Which, I love it. The, you, you know, everyone has those, um, you know, we used to call them trunk novels or desk drawer novels. And now they're, uh, you know, sitting on a hard drive novels, you know, as, yes. as, as writing has changed, but that's, that's hilarious. Um, I, I, I figured that you, you know, were one of those writers that had, had put in the work ahead of time. I, I love those stories. Um, Alicia, you, you wrote quite a number of romance novels, and um, looking back over your back catalog, they look to me to be historical romance novels. The, so this has been something that's always been a passion of yours. And um, what what was the difference uh, in writing The Woman at the Front um, versus uh, you know how you would approach the beginning of of a historical romance uh, novel. Had, had, I guess what I'm asking is when you began this project, mm -hmm. ha, was the beginning of it different for you? It, it was. Um, now, whenever uh, I, I start a book or when I, when I decided, okay, I'm going to write romance novels set in uh, the Regency, then, I mean, I, I, did, I do research on absolutely every aspect of that time period from the actual history, the politics, the culture, the food, the way they talk, the way they dress, um, and until you're absolutely familiar with it. And none of that, or a lot of that, does not go into the book, except sort of um, to give the flavor of the time period. It's not, you're, you're not teaching anybody a heavy history lesson, but you have to have that as, as your background. And um, with the woman at the front, um, I mean, I, I guess in Canada, we, we sort of, World War I is, is a very important war for us. I mean, we, we sort of came out as a nation to uh, um, 
to, to be reckoned with. And um, it was my grandfather's war. And he, he fought at Vimy Ridge, which is a famous Canadian battle. And so did his, his uh, older brother. And my grandfather was in the artillery. So he was well behind the, behind the lines with the big guns. And my great uncle was right at the front and he was killed the morning the battle started. And uh, my grandfather made me promise to go over and find his war grave someday, which I did eventually with my own family. And it was so moving. And that's when I knew I wanted to start right. I wanted to write a book about World War One. And I thought, OK, well, I'm, I'm a woman, so it's going to have to be about a nurse or a female character. And then during my research, and I researched the battles and uh, medical systems and everything else, I, I discovered that female doctors were not allowed on the front. Female nurses were, female volunteers, they had female ambulance drivers, but not female doctors, not for the, the British. And um, so I thought, well, that's going to be a much better story. So that led to an awful lot of, of more research about uh, medical systems and how women were treated and the history of female doctors in uh, well in that era across the world I guess so that's uh, that's part of the research that was done for the woman at the front authors I have a fantastic new service to tell you about it's called PubSite PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website your home on the web where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Hub-site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. What Death Taught Tarrant by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey, so is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it, a life-affirming journey. I found the story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden on sale now. Well, hearing that, Alicia, and, and then hearing your story uh, about your personal journey earlier and, and the things that, that you had to go through and people saying, um, you know, that, uh, uh if you're going to work as a writer in the eighties, you need to start in the typing pool and, you know, get that, that there are, are, uh, 
this this weird thing about about people having places in society you know it's not your place to do that like they, yes. there's no there are no women doctors in world war one it's not a woman's place to be there what you know in in talking about that in 2021 is such a bizarre concept um but uh, you know when you started kind of peeling back the layers of that what did you learn about these the the people that were on the front lines and and did you find people that were kind of going against the odds well absolutely um at the, at the beginning of the war a lot of qualified female doctors went to the war office and said that they raised the money they raised uh, all the equipment they had a staff they had basically um pop-up hospitals they're, they're they were ready to to be deployed and uh one one lady was told uh by the war office go home and sit down I mean, you can't do this we don't want this and so she she raised the money and took her her hospital to the french and a number of women did that and eventually uh some women uh there were two um that were invited to come back they were suffragettes and they were invited to come back to Britain and actually open a hospital in London, a military hospital. And it became one of the most successful hospitals um, of the war. And they treated some, I think it was 26,000 patients. And one of the excuses for not accepting women were, was it was it was too scary to be there. They, they couldn't possibly examine men um, in uh, in the trenches or they couldn't uh, they couldn't tolerate the swearing and the the rawness of the wounds or um, that they just weren't weren't capable of that men would be too afraid to see a, a woman bending over them as a as a surgeon as compared to a nurse who was seen as an angel of mercy. So, yeah, these women sort of did a lot to sort of help themselves. But I mean, still, uh, even though the French gave a lot of these women medals for for doing what they did, the British didn't even recognize them. And even even Marie Curie, who um, she set up a whole bunch of mobile um, X-ray vans, and she she went around sort of making sure that they could X-ray people before they cut their limbs off, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> saved a lot of lives. Uh, but the French, she offered the French her Nobel prizes because they were gold, and they said, "Well, we, we don't want those. We can't take them. They're 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 too hard to to deal with." <laughs> and she was never an amazing contribution that she made to to medicine at the time. So yes, women had a real struggle with with being uh, being recognized as. Uh, and I mean, during the war, they had to use them as locums in uh, in England uh, because the men were off at the front. But after the war, it was like, okay, back to treating the women and children for you. Um, and the, the doors of the medical schools that had opened to train women during the war, a lot of those closed again. And women were uh, very, very much expected to become, uh, to, to give up medicine entirely if they married. And uh, if they did not, they were expected to confine themselves to uh, just treating women and children. And a lot of uh, qualified doctors ended up, uh, they had a choice. They could treat the women and children or they could emigrate to places that needed doctors and were willing to accept their services across the board to treat anyone. Um, so that that happened a lot as well. So. Wow. When you're dealing with a, when you're telling a, a historical story um, set in in a time and around an event like World War One, where so much has been written so much has um uh we have so much information about these recent historical events and i know it's been over 100 years ago now um but you know it, as compared to the regency period you know there there's um there's a lot of information still out there um how do you begin um, because this this is a fictional story. It's a it's a, 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 a you know a set of fictional characters, but they live within this time that we do know about. Um, so how do you go about setting up um, kind of the tent poles of of your story that then these characters will work within? Um, you know, the kind of uh, how do you define um, the window that you're letting us look through into history? OK, um, well, I, I was very fortunate at the time that I, that I was writing the book uh, was was the hundred the centenary of the end of the war uh, around uh, 2018. 
And uh, so a lot more information was coming out and more memoirs were being published and more retrospectives were being done by museums and military historians. And, um, and I, I, I needed to find a, a time period to set it in and um, like a, within the war. And I found that the, the last part of the war, 1918, um, in the in the spring, the Germans made a tremendous advance against the British. They sort of threw everything they had into one last ditch effort to win. And the British were sort of caught off guard and they had to retreat very quickly. And that included all the frontline medical people as well. And um, the, the Germans were bombing hospitals and doctors and medical personnel were, were under fire at that point. So they were sort of um, backpedaling as quickly as they could. And I, I found that fascinating. And I was I was fortunate enough to um, we have a wonderful military museum here in Calgary um, about the different reg Alberta regiments that uh, that served in various wars. And they have a regular lecture series. And one of the, the lecturers is a professor at a local university named Jeff Jackson. And one of the things he spoke about was the that spring offensive of 1918. And that just was just, that's where I'm going to put it. That's where I'm going to set this, uh, this book. So, um, and it also gave me a chance to sort of take the story through to the very end of the war without, you know, having a long lag or four years of time to cover. And a very interesting time period within the war. Does that answer that? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And and what separates um, a dry history from um, uh, from a, a novel set in a historical period is characters that we care about and and adventures that they go on. Tell us about the the character of Eleanor. Where did she come from, and and how did did um, you know? Uh, it's it's fascinating to me. Do do characters just walk on the stage of your mind, and and you you know follow them to find out what they're up to um you know do you think of uh of you know you're thinking of this historical period and then um you know you cast characters for that how, how do you come up with characters and and what does what does eleanor mean to you um well eleanor is is sort of everything i'm not i mean she's brave and bold and she has adventures and she's determined and i'm rather shy and introverted and uh, live in my head with my characters <laughs> in my quiet little office. Um, so it's it's nice to be able to write somebody who's the complete opposite to have the kinds of adventures that uh, that I would if I was if I was braver and I was in a different time period. But um, to create a character, I mean, you come up with an idea. Okay, a female doctor. Okay, what would be her um, her backstory? What makes her want to become a doctor? What stops her from succeeding? And uh, what are her flaws? And what are her strong points? Um, I do a whole lot of character development so that um, I, I have created questionnaires over the years. I fill them in and I, I, I look up um, all sorts of details about um, what it was like to, to live during that time period and add them to her story so that when I sit down to write, I know exactly how she's going to react to pretty much any situation. Now, that's not to say that when you're writing, you don't actually get the, the absolute delight of the character suddenly doing something you don't expect. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, it's like writing magic. It's, uh, it just, it's like, oh, I had no idea that was going to happen. And that's even if you plot the book very carefully, sometimes a character will just surprise you with something that just works so beautifully. And it's it's almost like they're talking to you. <laughs> um. You know, writing is is one of the few things uh, that you can talk about in life and, and talk about these imaginary people that talk to you. Yes. <laughs> and, and no one looks at you like you're, you know, well, well there goes Leisha. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Well, that that brings up an interesting question for me because when you're writing historical fiction, um, it this story has to be rooted in these anchors of truth, in these anchors of historicity. When a character decides to go off and do something on her own, does that ever conflict with what we know as the historical fact? I I try not to let it stray too far. I mean, obviously, these are characters from history that had different rules and different uh, different time period. And sure. we are modern readers. 
Uh, but my daughter is a is a histor is a historian, and she would never let me get too far from the truth. Um, so I, I remember she wrote a, an essay for an en entrance to to university about how heinous it was that they took the story of the Tudors and they stuck Jonathan Rhys Myers in and completely rewrote the history. And we didn't need that because it was interesting enough. Um, so yes, but is she writing writing a character who who does things? I mean, they need to be accessible to to modern readers and they need to stand out in their own time period without sticking out i guess and um and being too uh too different to be believable so they they have to sort of have a certain amount of rootedness in what a woman would have done during that time period or who she would have been or what the expectations would have been and even if she she fights against them she's got to understand them and understand what she's doing um in order to uh to be realistic i think does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. Um, when when writing the woman at the front, um, I, you alluded to the fact that you um, are an outliner. And uh, yes. did did this story ever take a turn um, that that surprised you, um, you know, that maybe veered from your outline? Yes, um, a number of times. Um Let's see. I'm trying to think of one specific example, but um, yes, yeah, some of the things that uh, I read a, a research book about the dangers of. Uh, it's a wonderful book. It's called Writing Romance, and I think it was by Lynn Pierce. And it's about how people fall in love in different situations. And one of the chapters is on love during war, and how it becomes a threat because it's not um, if you're going to to succeed or if you're going to lose somebody, it's it's almost when I, I will lose this person. So it's a risk sort of giving your heart in that. So um, allowing Eleanor to fall in love when she had been so guarded about, um, about uh, you know, being careful of men because of the way she was treated during uh, university and the way her father viewed her um, as sort of a, an upstart and uh, sort of an embarrassment almost because she was a female doctor when she uh, she really should be a wife and mother. Um, and it it surprised me that she was able to sort of uh, do this with, uh, I wanted her to have a gentle edge and a, a firm determination. So when did she really surprise me? I guess when she sort of stepped up and took charge and that, uh, that uh, the things that she was willing to do to to make that happen and to to withstand that um that was kind of surprising but <laughs> I I, it. my I, when i wrote the first draft they said um heroines have to be completely and totally kick-ass to appeal to readers and editors and and everyone these days so i kind of had to go back and and uh, strengthen her a bit <laughs> make her more <laughs> more ferocious <laughs> Well, you definitely did that. Um, the woman at the front is uh, is available um, now. When you're hearing this, it came out yesterday for for a good many readers. Um, that this, if you're interested in the World War One period or just historical fiction in general, you're going to love this book. I'm recommending it to everyone. Uh, Alicia, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they connect with you online? Uh, well, they can, can visit my website, which is www.leishacornwall.com. So that's easy to find. I'm on Facebook and uh, Instagram. And if people would, my, my email uh, is on my website and I love hearing from people and I always answer. And uh, if I, I love the fact that libraries are carrying my books and uh, if you would, I would, I'm most thrilled when people read my work and suggest it to other people and it goes on from there. So yes, buy the book if you can and please read it if you, uh, in any way you can possibly do that. So. Cool. Well, we're going to send uh, everyone to see you, Alicia, at your website. We'll put links to that in the show notes and also links where you can buy it on Amazon, uh, Kindle edition or paperback or audiobook if you want to to uh, enjoy it in, in that experience. Uh, the Woman at the Front, available everywhere now when you're hearing this. Alicia, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. 
thank you so much for for having me. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you today, Hank. Thank you. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. Welcome to historic Sleepy Hollow, settled in 1640. Jason had looped around the town and had come up Broadway from the south. Behind the retaining wall next to the sign, a yard worker turned on his leaf blower, sending a tidal wave of yellow and red up and over the stones to splash off the windshield of the RV. They passed antique shops, a shell station, and a food king grocery. This is the same Broadway, you know, said Eliza. It goes all the way down to Times Square. Used to be an Indian trail, Manhattan to Fort Orange, for the fur trapping business. She kissed the dog. Oh, don't worry, baby, nobody's gonna skin you. And you know what the town's most famous for? Well, duh, Jason said. Every kid named Crane, especially one as tall and skinny as Jason, had heard a lifetime of Ichabod jokes. He hoped never to hear another. Did you know it was a real place? Of course, he said, though he hadn't. Don't be so smart, said Eliza. Turn here. The streets sloped towards the Hudson, the hillside trying to shake the village off its back. Jason slipped in behind a UPS truck and drove upwards. They turned onto Gory Brook Road. He stuck his head out the window, trying to pass. The UPS truck turned aside to the right. And he saw the house. Here! 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 said Eliza. She pointed at the driveway of 417 Gory Brook. Jason brought the RV to a smoke-belching halt. The house stood on a knoll, above a steep yard that angled downwards toward the Hudson. An ancient sycamore on the front lawn leaned precariously. The roof was an irregular A-frame, with a long slope on the left and a short one on the right, like a rotated checkmark. The upper floors were trimmed with bands of chocolate brown wood in a rectangular pattern. They made the house look as if it were trapped behind the bars of a jail cell. A tiny triangular portico extended over the front door, which was rough-hewn, rounded on top, held together by two vertical metal bands, and dotted with nail heads, a gothic novel in braille. The gray-blue curtains at the ground floor bay window gave the place a veiled eye aspect, like his grandmother's cataracts. The house seemed to be inspecting Jason with that eye. What are you doing here, boy? I'm watching you. Eliza put a hand on his shoulder. He jumped. This is it, she said. She slapped the dashboard. This is what? Our new home. But Jason turned to her, baffled. Her face sparkled with delight. Surprise, 